Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 798 for December 22nd, 2019. Coming up in a few minutes. And I said, okay, you know, I made a decision. We're going to move to Scotland. You know, I want to make whiskey for a living. I don't want to sit around in a boardroom and look at uh, Excel spreadsheet and do valuations all my life. Uh, I want to do something more where I can dye in my hands and my head and my, you know, uh, everything. The Lakes Distillery in Setmerthy, England, celebrated its fifth anniversary last weekend. Davil Gandhi is the distillery's chief whiskey maker. His journey started out in the financial world, but the passion for whiskey called him to his real career. He'll share his story with us later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. I'll also have the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice, behind the label, and a whole lot more. All on this holiday week edition of Whiskey Cast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. And it would be a cliche to suggest that U.S. distillers got a Christmas present from Congress this week when the federal excise tax break for small-scale distillers was extended for one more year. But that is essentially what happened. The tax break was scheduled to expire at midnight on New Year's Eve, but the real deadline was this past Friday when Congress started its holiday recess. The Senate's final approval came on Thursday, following a House vote Tuesday. President Donald Trump signed the spending bills that included the tax break late Friday before leaving for his own holiday break in Florida. As we reported last time around, there were craft distillers prepared to start laying off workers this weekend had the tax break not been extended. Margie Lehrman is the executive director of the American Craft Spirits Association. Not only will we not have those immediate layoffs, we won't have farmers hearing that their grain orders are being canceled. We won't hear that uh, the negotiations on Equipment purchases will stop, and uh, hopefully as well, we won't hear that there will be uh, cuts in terms of benefits. I think our members themselves can breathe just a little bit as ACSA continues with our industry cousins to take up the fight on Capitol Hill. Was there ever a chance that this wasn't going to get included? How close did you come? Um, you know, that's anybody's guess because the reality is one moment you are feeling pretty good and the next moment, based on another conversation, whether it's in the hall or, or within an office, you're feeling uh, maybe somewhat defeated. There clearly was that chance. Uh, if the Congress did not pick up on the extender package, the reality was that we would not have uh, relief next year. And I think Congress did see that many of the provisions absolutely merited support. Uh, I know that there were some votes against even the appropriations bill today that was more of a philosophical uh, vote, almost like a protest vote against rather than the merits of the content within. Legislation to make the tax break permanent is still tied up in committees on Capitol Hill, but has more than 330 sponsors in the House and 73 in the Senate. And getting votes on it will be an industry priority when the holiday recess ends in Washington. I do know that we were thrilled when we actually had a piece of legislation where all the parties could come together. When I say all the parties, I mean beer, wine, and spirits, both big and small. And to be quite honest, I don't know whether we would have had the same momentum if we tried to do this just on your own. So I think that there is strength in numbers. I do believe that we made our case. Otherwise, we would never have reached those number of co-sponsors. And I believe that we have um, at least a fighting chance. And as you know, distillers are are 
determined and resilient and we can be gritty and we will keep paving those those halls until we just get this done. The spending package also included a separate one-year extension for another tax provision that helps distillers. It allows them to deduct the so-called capitalized interest that they pay on loans secured by their inventories of maturing whiskey and other spirits. The tax issue is not the only priority the whiskey industry and consumers will face as the new year begins, though. There's a public comment period that runs through January 13th on a Trump administration proposal to raise the new 25% tariff on single malt whiskies from Scotland and Northern Ireland to as high as 100% along with similar increases on other European exports. That's after the latest World Trade Organization ruling against the European Union in the battle over aircraft subsidies for Airbus. U.S. officials are also looking at adding more goods to the tariff list, including whiskies from all over the European Union. Distilled Spirits Council CEO Chris Swanger will be hosting his colleagues from the Scotch Whiskey Association and other European spirits groups right after the holidays to lobby Trump administration officials, and they'll be in Brussels at the end of January to meet with EU leaders. The goal is to get both sides back to negotiating resolutions to the aircraft subsidy issue and other trade disputes. But Swanger says there's also a place for whiskey lovers to raise their voices over the tariff issue. We have a a broad grassroots platform called spiritunited.org. We've also launched a grassroots platform called Toast Not Tariffs. And uh, you can go on the Spirit United platform and uh, learn more about the Toast Not Tariffs platform and can direct letters uh, uh, directly. Uh, to the Trump administration, so they're uh, very much aware of uh, the impact to our industry, and uh, we're also working with our European partners to do the same. Uh, we need your listeners to help, really, and uh, this impacts consumers, bartenders, retailers, farmers, the agriculture community. The whole supply chain is impacted, so our call to action is uh, all t- to all of your listeners. Please get out the word and help, you can again go on www.spiritunited.org and go to the Toast Not Terrace platform and get your word out and make sure your voice is heard uh, with the Trump administration. While there is still no data yet on the impact of the U.S. tariffs on single malts from Scotland and Northern Ireland, Swanger says the latest data from Europe shows the European Union's 25% tariff on bourbons and other American whiskies has now led to a 28% drop in U.S. whiskey exports to Europe. That's based on exports between January and the end of October compared to a year ago. That tariff was imposed almost 18 months ago after the U.S. imposed tariffs on imports of steel and aluminum from Europe and other key trading partners. China was one of those countries as well, and it also retaliated with a 25% tariff on American whiskey exports. There were questions about the future of that tariff after the U.S. and China reached what's being called Phase 1 of a new trade deal last week. We have now been able to confirm that while that tariff will remain in place for now, China has agreed to hold off on imposing an additional 30% tariff that would have gone into effect this past week without that new agreement. And just one other note on trade. Since 2006, the Distilled Spirits Council has been getting federal funding from the U.S. Agriculture Department to promote American spirits exports around the world. The trade group is getting a raise in 2020 with about $511,000 to fund its export promotion programs. That's an increase of nearly 15% over fiscal year 2019 funding. Discus also received about $1.2 million earlier this year from an agriculture department program aimed specifically at helping industry sectors affected directly by tariffs on their exports. In other news... Beam Suntory kicked off its global collaborations earlier this year with Suntory AO in Japan, which blends whiskies from its distilleries in Japan, Scotland, Ireland, Canada, and the U.S. 
The company followed that up with Legion Bourbon, a collaboration between Suntory head blender Shinji Fukuyo and Jim Beam's Fred No. Now Beam Suntory is closing the year out with Oaksmith. It's exclusive to the Indian market and blends Scotch whiskey, bourbon, and grain spirits. Once again, Shinji Fukuyo created both the Oaksmith and Oaksmith Gold versions. There are currently no plans to sell them outside of India. The Last Drop Distillers is releasing a new single-grain Scotch whiskey. It's a 42-year-old distilled in 1977 at the former Dumbarton Distillery. It's the second release of Dumbarton from The Last Drop. Just 150 bottles will be available. No word on pricing. Douglas Lang & Company is releasing the final edition in its Big Pete Aged Trilogy Vintage series. This year's release is the 27-year-old black edition of Big Pete. It marks the 10th anniversary for the I Love Blended Malt brand. It's also a follow-up to last year's 26-year-old platinum edition and the 2017 25-year-old gold edition. Only 3,000 bottles will be available worldwide. This month also marks the 10th anniversary for Utah's High West Distillery, and High West is releasing a new whiskey to celebrate. High Country American Single Malt blends High West casks between 2 and 9 years old. It'll be available in Utah for now. Cuddy Sark is one of those legacy Scotch whiskey brands that has struggled in recent years. It was part of Berry Brothers and Rudd for many, many years, until an asset swap with Edrington saw it become part of that company back in 2010. Edrington sold it to Francis Lamartini Kays in November of last year, where it has become part of the company's Glen Turner subsidiary in Scotland, along with Glen Murray. Now the owners have signed a deal with Sazerac's 375 Park Avenue Spirits to serve as the new U.S. importers for Cuddy Sark. The deal takes effect in February. And finally, one of Scotland's historic golf courses will be getting a new clubhouse in 2020. A year ago this month, fire destroyed the clubhouse at Macrahanish Golf Club on the Campbellton Peninsula. Glen Scotia Distillery donated a cask of whiskey to the fundraising campaign to build a new clubhouse. According to the drinks business this week, sales of the 196 bottles at the Glen Scotia Visitors Center raised more than 10,000 pounds for the golf club. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Larceny Bourbon's heritage goes back to the days when Treasury agent John E. Fitzgerald was patrolling the Rick Houses of Kentucky, not just for the feds, but also for himself. Fitzgerald was stealing a taste of some of his favorite barrels of weeded bourbon on the side. Today's award-winning Larceny Bourbon has that same soft, smooth character that Fitzgerald loved. Look for 92-proof Larceny Bourbon at your local retailer, and be on the lookout for the upcoming limited edition release of Larceny Barrel Proof. Find out more at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. Time now for the Whiskey Cast Calendar of Events. The Scotch Malt Whiskey Society's UK chapter has Hogmanay celebrations coming up next Tuesday night on New Year's Eve at both the Vaults and the Queen Street Members Rooms in Edinburgh, Scotland. The US chapter will start off January with tastings in New York, Chicago, Miami, Los Angeles, and San Francisco on January 6th, and in Orlando, Florida on the 7th. The National Whiskey Festival is January 5th in Glasgow, Scotland. The Arctic Whiskey Festival is on the 11th in Tromso, Norway. And Whiskey Wonderland 2020 is on the 12th in Long Beach, California. Join us again this year for special coverage from the Victoria Whiskey Festival in Victoria, British Columbia. It runs from January 16th through the 19th. Hansa Spirit 2020 is January 30th through February 2nd in Hamburg, Germany. And Whiskey Live Bangkok is in the Thai capital on January 31st and February 1st. 
By the way, we have a bunch of Burns Night celebrations around the world on the calendar for the end of January. If you're planning a Burns Night event, let us know about it and we'll add it to the calendar. Right now, we have 184 different events on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. Just click on the search button to find events near you or wherever you'll be traveling during 2020. Everyone knows the expression, "'Tis better to give than to receive." At Redbreast, we don't think the two are mutually exclusive. Maybe it's better to give Redbreast and receive. Like receiving a glass or two right away for your thoughtful gift of Ireland's definitive single pot still whiskey. Or receiving that, hey, thanks again for that bottle of red breast, a month later. Or receiving that shout out in a wedding speech for introducing the groom to red breast, completely overlooking the fact that you introduced him to his bride as well. What we're trying to say is, introducing someone to red breast will come back to you in unexpected ways. Red breast, you've landed on something special. Now be sure to share it. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. Last weekend, the Lakes Distillery in Setmurthy, England, celebrated its fifth anniversary with a party at the distillery. It's located in the Lake District National Park in northwestern England, just a few miles away from the Scottish border, a place where poets, artists, and wildlife lovers have made their refuges from the daily stress of life for decades. Novel Gandhi found his refuge in the lakes as well. He's the whiskey maker at the Lakes Distillery, and we had a chance to spend some time on the phone this week. Let's first of all talk about the fifth anniversary at the Lakes mm-hmm. uh, this past weekend. You had a pretty good crowd come out, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. We we usually have a very good crowd come out at uh, the Lakes Distillery birthday every year. But we also have uh, something called Founders Day. So these are, uh, you know, a group of, uh, you know, very enthusiastic uh, supporters of Lake Distillery. So we used to have a Founders Day in December, but now we have tried to make two days during the year. One is the Founders Day and one is the Lakes Distillery birthday, which we celebrate with all of our supporters. So it's, uh, you know, it's a full day of events. There is a barbecue. There are tours going around. Uh, all day. Then I also have sessions with uh, people who come in. So it's a very exciting and fun day for everybody. Tell me the origin story behind the distillery. It's not exactly a place that's well known for whiskey making, is it? Yeah, yeah. Historically, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, founded by uh, Paul Curry. And Paul Curry uh, used to be involved uh, historically with the Isle of Aran distilleries with his dad, uh, Harold Curry. And uh, Paul, uh, on his holiday uh, to the Lake District, decided that he wanted to, uh, you know, start a whiskey distillery in England. And uh, he loved the, you know, the way the climate is in Lake District. So he joined forces with a local entrepreneur and a businessman called Nigel Mills. And they both founded the Lake Distillery uh, in 2011. And it took a long time because the distillery is located in a derelict farm, uh, which was a disused Victorian farm. Uh, and uh, it, it was a long and painful restoration and a lot of planning permission because we are also in the National Park, uh, Lake District National Park area. and then. Uh, they started distilling in 2014. So uh, December 2014 is when we started uh, distilling single malt whiskey. Now, the company is set up as a single malt whiskey distillery. That's a primary business. Uh, but, you know, like other distilleries, we also have uh, a gin and a vodka unit uh, separate, which is a separate unit to the distillery, but it's still part of the Lakes Distillery. So it started in 2014, and then I joined the company in 2016 uh, from McCullen, and uh, I have been there ever since. And uh, initially, I started in the capacity of a blender, and then I took over the whiskey operation side of it. So I currently manage everything from whiskey and gin and vodka production and also the blending side of things. Now, uh, the distillery uh, was, uh, we we are in England, uh, but we follow the Scotch whiskey uh, regulations. So even though we are in England, 
the only difference between our distillery and a distillery in Scotland would be that it's distilled south of the border, but that's about it. And the reason for that is our chairman, uh, Dr. Alan Rutherford, uh, you know, he was the ex-production director for Diageo before he retired. And, uh, you know, his vision was to create a much more Scotch style of whiskey here. And uh, that's what we uh, currently do at Lakes. Let's go through your background because uh, you have a pretty interesting background as well as uh, that of the founders. Uh, yeah, uh, my my journey is uh, not very straightforward, but I actually, I grew up in India in a very small uh, coastal town called uh, Valsad, and that is very close to Mumbai. So, I mean, Mumbai is the closest uh, big city. Uh, and then uh, I uh, moved to America for my undergrad studies. So I went to Carolina and I studied corporate finance and economics. Um, I don't come necessarily from an engineering background. I lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I used to work for a company called Ernst & Young. Uh, and I used to be in uh, corporate finance. So, uh, you know, I, I used to travel quite a bit for work. And one of our clients uh, was in Kentucky. So, you know, usually what would happen is every uh, weekend, you know, after you finish your project, wherever you are in the world, you end up going home to your base office, which is uh, which was Charlotte for me. And uh, my colleague uh, was also very interested in single malt whiskeys. So while we were traveling, we were trying all these different whiskeys. And um, we were in Kentucky, so, you know, we had an option to go home over the weekend because we were supposed to come back out on Monday. So we decided, okay, we'll just stay back uh, in Kentucky and we'll just visit all the bourbon distilleries. And uh, that was it, I think, for me. So we, I, I think that time, this is, I'm talking around 2008, there were around 14 distilleries, if I'm not mistaken. And we ended up going to most of them uh, during the weekend. And the last one was Maker's Mark. And uh, I was... Uh, you know, sitting outside on the uh, steps of Maker's Mark, and I still have that photo with me. And, uh, you know, we also met Bill Samuels there. And I just ended up talking and chatting about, you know, how do I get into the whiskey industry, what, what's going on. It was very fascinating for me. But just then and there, I just made a decision that that's what I want to do with my life. I wanted to become a whiskey blender, not, not a distiller, you know, first place, but just I wanted to be the blender. And uh, the only way I could do that was to move to Scotland, uh, you know, the epicenter of whiskey. And I, I love Scotch whiskey. So I thought, this is what I'm going to do. I go back home. I finish the project, go back home, take my wife out for dinner. My wife's name is Shivani. And I said, okay, you know, <laughs> I made a decision. We're going to move to Scotland. You know, I want to make whiskey for a living. I don't want to sit around in a boardroom and look at... Uh, Excel spreadsheet and do valuations all my life. Uh, I want to do something more where I can dine my hands and my head and my, you know, uh, everything. So, And what did she say? She almost fell off the chair, but, but uh, she, uh, she was very supportive. And I think uh, I'm lucky to have uh, such a supportive wife who has completely supported my journey. And then she said yes. And she was actually studying uh, uh, for a you know, corporate finance as well. She's she's a financier as well. And uh, so she decided to finish her uh, postgraduate studies in Carolina. And uh, I moved to Edinburgh. And uh, the story was such, uh, it was so uh, different because at that point, there was something that this is what I wanted to do in my life. And, you know, I just packed bags and we decided to move to Edinburgh. And I started searching because it was easier for me to get Probably it would have been easier for me to get into the whiskey industry in, in, in a finance capacity to work in a finance office or a finance department for a company, but I wanted to be the blender. And uh, I started researching uh, how do I get into the industry. And at that time, there were probably three universities. One was uh, University of California, Davis, but they only had a degree in brewing. Uh, then second, uh, there was one in France, but it was more focused on brandy. And there was Harriet Watt University, uh, which had a postgraduate degree program. So uh, in brewing and distilling, and you know that's what I applied for. And initially, I, you know, I, they had a bit of resistance because I came from a finance background, and you know the uh, 
the admissions committee th- thought that you know I might not be suitable for doing uh, you know a degree in you know which is more involved chemical engineering biochemistry it's quite technical uh, so uh, you know I uh, they said you know you can come and join us uh, at the Harriet Watt but we won't give you a postgraduate degree but if you prove to us within the first semester that uh, you can manage uh, doing uh, you know uh, studying for brewing and distilling you know we'll give you a degree so i i took the risk i said this is <laughs> i'm going to do it no matter what happens whether they give the degree or not at least you know i'll learn and at least i'll be one step closer so then i moved to edinburgh i enrolled at harriet watt i started my program and yes i did well and then the you know the admissions committee decided that you know they will uh you know give me the master's degree in brewing and distilling i did my also my research thesis was whiskey maturation and then when i graduated uh, there were not many jobs in whiskey blending at that time there was nothing at that uh, uh time when i graduated so again i was in this big uh, fix where should i go back uh and join uh and like of once in young in consulting and just you know call this or should i just stick around and at that time i decided to you know i said like no i want to stick around uh and then uh, there was nothing in distilling so i took a, a, a offer from uh, heineken and i joined heineken uh in the capacity of the brewer uh then you know brewmaster and then i worked in various roles in heineken until I was at uh, Amsterdam airport and I got a call from a headhunter recruiter saying that uh, there is a opportunity in blending and uh, believe me mark there were three companies at that time having uh, uh, you know openings in blending so I you know I applied and uh, out of the two uh, I uh, out of the three I applied and I got uh, offers for two and I decided to go with Macallan because you know it was macallan and i was very passionate about you know sherry whiskey and you know uh, macallan is the rolls royce of whiskey when you talk about it and uh, the what what was more fascinating to me was uh, you know the work they do in sherry cask and the work they do in maturation so i uh, moved from uh, heineken to macallan uh, then moved to elgin uh, so lived there so my wife moved from charlotte uh to Edinburgh Edinburgh to Elgin and then uh worked uh in at the Easter Elk Keith House on uh, Macallan Distillery and then moved to uh Edrington's headquarters in Glasgow uh where I worked on a lot of uh you know uh, projects uh, alongside a lot of blenders there there's Gordon there was Gordon there and Max McFarlane and then I get a call from Dr Alan Rutherford our current chairman because I knew Alan Rutherf- uh, Rutherford through a common friend of mine so i got a call while i was driving home and he said i'm building this uh, working on this you know exciting project in england and you know i want to get a blender and to come in and completely you know change things around uh, you know decide the direction where to take the company and also create whiskies for uh, you know the lakes distillery are you interested in this option so first at first with her english distillery and i was at macalla like uh not sure but uh, he said just come and you know meet us uh, see what you think of the distillery so then uh, you know i took the offer i drove down to lakes and just fell in love with the place it was such a compact site but it was so positive it, there was there was a positivity about the site the people involved and also uh, dr rutherford uh, you know offered me the role and he said i'll give you complete carte blanche you know come in you know i want you to you know just decide where you want to take the company where you want to take the product look at the new mix spirit make the changes you want to make and i thought you know that was a once in a lifetime opportunity for me because you know you know macallan was great and i loved it the people were amazing but you are you are making the same whiskey every day you are trying to maintain a house style that was created while here i could define the house style from you know day one from scratch and i thought that was very very exciting and at the same time uh, you know english whiskey at that time mark uh, you know uh, there was there were one or two distilleries making whiskey but it was not that respected 
the overall the category i mean uh in the industry so you know i thought that's a challenge and you know something where you know if we f- do the right thing in the in focus of attentions on various aspects of creating flavor i think we can make that happen and make make good whiskey uh in even in england so that's where my story is that's how i got involved with lake how did you develop your passion for whiskey in the first place besides those uh, distillery trips if you already had the passion before you were touring distilleries in Kentucky where did it come from uh i was there were two things going on even uh, in childhood i always had a sense of uh, you know intense i could i could uh, differentiate different aromas and i had this sense of uh, uh, you know about perfumes and uh, flavors and i always liked it but from a whiskey perspective you know my dad i got a lot from my dad because my dad and my grandfather both were uh, you know the, they enjoyed the whiskies uh, so i think my first uh, probably dram would have been either a johnny walker black label or something from my dad's glass uh, uh, on one of the uh, weekend evenings uh, when he would enjoy it. but my dad also enjoyed a lot of different a whiskey so every time you know i used to uh, ask questions so it was something from childhood i was always uh, uh, familiar with all the different styles of course i didn't know as much about the whiskey as i did in the uh, states when i started to explore it further but uh, whiskey as a drink you know i knew from my family so that's why uh, i got that and uh, you know i think when i was in america uh, and i was in consulting that helped a lot as well because uh, you know as as consultants you travel all the time and you are always in a hotel with clients or client meetings and for me that was a great opportunity to try different different whiskies and i think uh, the first one uh, was lagavulin 16 <laughs> uh, you know and uh, you know one thing led to the other How did you develop the house style for the Lakes Distillery? So the house style uh for me when I came in and I think Lakes uh initially was the plan was to be a more you know bourbon uh, focused and uh, most of the laydowns was bourbon with you know uh, sherry as well. But for me I always enjoyed uh sherry whiskies and for me you know Macallan or you know Glenrunach or Abelard or Abuna those are the you know whiskies i enjoy personally and i always believe that i always wanted to create something that i enjoy drinking rather than creating a specific style and for me because i had that freedom here to create what i wanted to create and my experience at Macallan with Sherry Cask and uh, i thought the best way to differentiate the brand at the same time create this you know intense rich character i could uh, focus on sherry cask uh, uh, maturation so uh, you know what i decided was that the whole uh, style would be based on sherry but i wanted to be slightly more elegant uh, more more moorish and uh, more sweeter more dry fruit not as uh, you know uh, not as stronger as other ones but just more delicate style of sherry much more elegant lighter style so that's how i try to create and that's what uh, the whiskey makers reserve series is all about uh, much more delicate uh, complex whiskey with full of flavor i want it flavor uh, and that's something i try to you know create with all the expressions how will your whiskies change as you get more age on them you still have fairly young stuff right now but as it gets older what do you expect it to uh, become as it matures Yeah for me I think uh you know time is the only thing that gives you that depth and a much more rounded uh, nest character I think I would like to continue uh with the same intensity of sherry uh, as you have seen in whiskey makers reserve uh but I think over time my plan is to also introduce age statements because uh, we are currently focusing uh you know we are 130000 liters right now full capacity we run uh but from next year we go to around 400000 liters of uh, pure alcohol per year so we are increasing its uh, capacity considerably and the uh, the reason for doing that is i want to have more stock that i can play around with and 
you know, I also like uh, refill sherry casks. I love refill sherry casks, and I think uh, a refill sherry cask can give some exciting and very, very balanced character of sherry uh, versus the distillery character. So what I'm trying to do from next year is, uh, you know, try to split the stock between different kinds of casks, uh, sherry, refill, uh, and there are some other uh, casks that I'm working on as well. So I think I'll, I think the Lakes Distillery style will remain very similar. The house style will be very, very similar to what you have seen, the Whiskey Makers Reserve. But I think there'll be more variation. There'll be more uh, deeper and much more mellower styles because I think age, uh, you can't speed up age. Uh, so it takes time. And I think you will get more depth and complexity as the time goes. You mentioned that uh, English whiskey when you started out at the lakes, did not have a widely known reputation. Mm -hmm. We are seeing more and more of the so-called world whiskeys, and I lump England in with that as a non-traditional country that Mm -hmm. produces whiskeys. What is the potential for English whiskey? We're seeing more and more distilleries popping up from London north all the way up to the Scottish border, like your place. What is the potential for English whiskey? Oh, I think there is great potential because, uh, you know, there are so many different styles of whiskey coming out. And that's what's exciting about, uh, you know, English whiskey uh, or the world whiskey. You know, currently, I think the most exciting category is the world whiskey for me because uh, a lot of producers are trying different things. They are trying to uh, create their own interpretation on how to make, uh, you know, better whiskey, how to add more flavor. Some are focusing more on the distillate character some are uh, experimenting a lot with yeast some are trying to change uh, you know uh, the the raw materials from you know using different kinds of malts and some are using different casks so i think it is a lot of opportunities i think to uh, for everybody to showcase a different style that they want to create and i think it's more fun because if everybody creates good whiskey you know, the consumers get a lot of options to choose from. And I think it's also exciting that people are trying out different things and not just sticking to what they think, you know, whiskey should be rather than what it could be. This is going to be a sensitive question, and feel free to pass on it if you'd like. You are not the typical blender or whiskey maker within the whiskey industry Mm -hmm. because of your ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Have you ever run into any pushback because of that or people who uh, were wondering, who is this guy and what credentials does he have? Uh, Well, uh, absolutely not. I mean, I think uh, the scotch whiskey industry, and I call it my industry because, you know, that's where I started my career and I still have a lot of friends in Blended. I think they have embraced me. I I have never felt that I was an outsider or I was... You know, not a typical, uh, you know, uh, whiskey maker in uh, in the United Kingdom. But uh, no, I think uh, you know I couldn't be more uh, thankful for the industry for their support. And everybody is so good to me. They have helped me out in various stages. And as you know, Mark, whiskey making or being a blender is not uh, something that you. It's like a tick box exercise. It's a lifelong learning thing. You continuously evolve, you grow, you learn new things. And I think uh, most importantly, what I have learned about whiskey making is that you spend a lifetime, you know, uh, of uh, learning what not to do and how not to make whiskey. And that's what you make whiskey for. But in fact, I think uh, there's no pushback from anybody else. Uh, So if we keep the industry aside, sometimes when I used to travel and if, if you are at a bar, or if you're at a restaurant and, you know, and I used to work for McCullough and I, even I work for Lakes right now. And sometimes I, you know, I recommend something or I say, uh, you know, you no, know, I used to, when I used to work for McCullough and I say, oh yeah, I'm the you know, whiskey maker for McCullough. And I, you know, I make that stuff that you see there. And it was hard for people to believe that, <laughs> uh, you know, there could be a blender sitting next to it uh, who would do it. But from an industry perspective, absolutely not. I think it's one of the best industry and one of the best people working in the industry, whether whether my colleagues in Japan or whether colleagues in Scotland or whether colleagues in America, I've been never felt uh, that I've been from an outsider, just felt at home always. That's really great to hear. Uh, 
I've, I've never heard anybody say anything differently, and uh, I've, I find that refreshing within this industry. Yeah, and I think uh, regard, uh, you know, a lot of people think uh, that there's a lot of rivalry or, you know, people don't talk to each other. But in fact, we, everybody shares so much things. Uh, if you, I know right now that if I have a problem uh, with something or if I don't understand, I can just pick up a phone and I can call, you know, any of the, you know, blending colleagues uh, in Scotland or Japan or uh, U.S. and I, you know, I'll be completely given the right advice and what to do and what not to do. So I think it's that's a that's the best thing about this uh, career is the uh, is the fraternity that you have uh, in terms of your colleagues, in terms of the companies. So yeah, it's a good question, though. Yeah, nobody succeeds completely on their own. We all have mentors of one type or another as we uh, grow in our careers. Who were yours? Let's give them uh, some credit here. Oh, there are so many mentors. Uh, uh, I think uh, the one person who has been a mentor and now is a very, very close friend is John Glaser from Compass Box. So, uh, you know, uh, John has uh, been in touch with me ever since I first probably, uh, you know, landed in uh, UK and, you know, I decided to uh, change my career into whiskey. And uh, that is how I got in touch with, uh, that. that is how I knew Dr. Ellen Rutherford, uh, our chairman at Lakes Distillery. And, you know, so that was a connection between Lakes and myself beforehand. Uh, there are a lot of other people as well. I, I think uh, I feel so bad that I might miss out someone. But I think, you know, Max McFarlane, uh, whiskey maker for Island Park, Max taught me a lot about blending, uh, understanding and, you know, how do I trust my gut and, uh, you know, how do I take a split second decisions on samples. So Max taught me a lot. Uh, of course, uh, you know, I said John Glaser, Bob Delgano uh, from McCullen. Uh, Bob taught me a lot about how to put together McCullen in a something very different way. Uh, you know, so from a blending perspective, those three, you know, uh, I, I also to thank uh, Richard Patterson as well, because I think Richard was one of the first uh, or the second person I, uh, blender I got in touch with, and I've uh, uh, been in touch with him ever since. Uh, but again, I think uh, those, I think for me, uh, you know, John Glaser uh, is definitely the one person who has you know, helped me a lot in my career and guided me at all different stages. But uh, there are a lot of other people. I, I, I can name each and every blender, I think, uh, in the industry who has helped me in that time and career. Uh, so even right now, uh, you know, Dr. Ellen Rutherford has also been a mentor to me from a different, uh, different side because I think mentorship is so different in different areas. So sometimes you need mentorship in, your blending and sometimes you need mentorship in you know your career and business decisions sometimes in your life so i think there are so many mentors uh, but uh, i think one other person who has been uh, like a rock for me is my wife shivani without her support she had moved eight houses uh, just so that i can follow my uh, dream of making whiskey all the way from uh, charlotte north carolina uh, to Elgin, to York, to Edinburgh, to Lakes, to Edinburgh again. So I think that one person, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't be here without her support and also my parents' support. I'm very, very grateful. The closeness of Scotland to the distillery has led to some interesting cross-border blends. Davil Gandhi created the Steel Bonnets blended malt last year using some of his distillery's whiskey and malts from Scotland. And The One uses both malts and grain whiskey from Scotland, blended with single malt from the lakes. That range also includes sherry and port cask finished expressions as well. And even though the distillery is in England, it'll be holding our Robert Burns Night celebration on January 25th. You'll find a link for more details in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret, hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies. Comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup 
at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Let's start with Davil Gandhi's latest release in the Lakes Distillery's Whiskey Makers Reserve Series. Batch number two is matured in a combination of Pedro Jimenez, red wine, and ex-bourbon barrels. It's bottled at 60.9% ABV. The nose has notes of dried fruits, gentle spices, sawdust, vanilla, and caramel candy. The taste is full of Christmas cake, along with baking spices, stewed prunes, and a hint of caramel. The long finish has touches of berry cobbler, soft spices, red grapes, and a hint of brandy. I'm scoring the Whiskey Makers Reserve Series Batch Number 2, a 91. Now, the Whiskey Fairy delivered an interesting sample the other day, all the way from Sweden. Gotland Whiskey's distillery is located on Gotland Island in the Baltic Sea and bottles its whiskey under the Isle of Lime brand. Its shareholders edition number four single malt is nicknamed Vardbjarg after a historic site on the island and is made from four to six-year-old whiskey matured in virgin oak casks. It's bottled at 50.5% ABV and the nose has notes of linseed oil, old wood, lemon zest, and green tea with honey. The taste is tart and peppery with touches of lemon pepper, linseed oil, oak, honey, vanilla, and dark chocolate. The finish is long and tart, and I'm scoring the Isle of Lime Vardbjarg an 89. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first... This week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. Rye whiskey was distilled by America's original risk takers and history makers. Those first barrels of whiskey were bold, flavorful, and full of passion. Sagamore Spirit proudly picked up the torch with their spring-fed Maryland-style rye whiskey that celebrates the grit and glory of those patriotic ancestors who sipped their way into American history. Visit SagamoreSpirit.com to explore their award-winning spirit. It pays to look around whiskey shops whenever you're traveling, since you might just find some whiskeys that you may not be able to get at home. For instance, when I was in Australia a few months ago, I found a bottle of a Johnny Walker Blender's Batch release that was never sold in the U.S., Blender's Batch Sweet Peat was created by Blender's Jim Beveridge and George Harper using Kalila and Glendullen as the core whiskeys in the blend. It's bottled at 40.8% ABV. The nose has a touch of tangy barbecue sauce along with honey, grilled fruits, toasted coconut, and hints of toffee and oak. The taste is tangy, tart, and well-balanced with barbecue sauce, honey, crystallized ginger, grilled pineapple, and a hint of coconut. The finish is long and subtle with a kiss of sweet smoke and touches of honey and butterscotch. I'm scoring the Johnny Walker Blender's Batch Sweet Peat Edition a 92. And let's finish up with a bourbon. We mentioned a while back that Beam Suntory was turning Baker's bourbon into a single-barrel bottling, but in addition to the flagship 7-year-old version, there's also a new limited edition 13-year-old single barrel named for Baker Beam. It's bottled at 53.5% ABV, the same as the original Baker's. The nose is aromatic and rich with classic bourbon notes of leather, tobacco, honey, molasses, vanilla, and caramel. The taste is chewy and thick with good spicy notes of black pepper and allspice, balanced out by dark chocolate, honey, molasses, and a hint of tobacco leaves. The finish is nice and long with subtle spices and a good sweetness. I'm scoring the Baker's 13-year-old single-barrel bourbon a 93. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,700 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out today at WhiskeyCast.com. From deep in the north, far beyond the wall... 
The howl of the frozen wind brings word of something new. A whiskey from the land of always winter for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. We'll be announcing our next Whiskey Club of the Month soon. Each month, we pick a whiskey club somewhere in the world to honor as our Club of the Month. The club gets two dozen whiskey cast Glencairn glasses to use at their club tastings, courtesy of our friends at Glencairn Crystal. If you're in a whiskey club, all you have to do is use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Tell us a bit about your club, and if you have a website or a social media presence, we'll be glad to add a link on our Whiskey Clubs page at the WhiskeyCast website. Join us on the January 5th episode when we'll announce the next Whiskey Club of the Month. Now, let's open up the inbox for your voice, presented by Lot 40. I decided to have a little bit of fun this week on social media and put this question out there for you. What one bottle of whiskey are you hoping to receive this holiday season? A couple of caveats. It has to be for drinking, not for flipping on the secondary market. And the price limit is $250. Otherwise, you'd have all been picking those ultra-rare bottles that cost thousands of dollars. Joel High posted this on our Facebook page. Each Christmas I ask for a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label, but I seem to be on Santa's naughty list and I just get coal. David Jacob added this from Montreal. I would love to get my hands on a Glendalock Mizanara 13-year-old or Westland Gariana, but my hopes are not high because, you know, Canada. Also from Quebec, Chantal Dontremont tweeted this. I'd go for a Springbank 18. SAQ in Quebec has it listed, but hardly ever available. Nathan Todd posted this from Australia. Ah, man, 250 won't get me close to a bottle of Limeburner's Heaviest Peat. So let's just say, if I could get it here in Australia, Iron Root Republic's Icarus. Our friend Lincoln Chinnery, at Lincoln Writes on Twitter, tweeted this from New York City. Dare Whiskey Santa, a bottle of McAllen Rare Cask 2017 release, batch number two, please. I've been very good this year. I've managed not to strangle anyone this year. It goes without saying that stranglings automatically get you a spot on the naughty list. Also from Twitter... Be Whiskeyed had a problem narrowing down her list. Oh, so hard to pick one. Old Pulteney, 21, a fave. Glen Scotia, 18, or Redbreast Lestow. And at Drew7182 tweeted this, A dream would be a midwinter's night dram, but honestly I'd be happy with a bottle of Wild Turkey 101 or Knob Creek Small Batch. Any of those three would be an amazing gift. And from Instagram, Dram Stewart posted this, Any Springbank local barley. I'm a simple man, Mark, with a winking emoji. Yeah, right. Well, here's hoping each of you gets the whiskey you're dreaming of this holiday season. And if you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers all over the world, you can always find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at WhiskeyCast. Or you can just email us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other things that all combine to make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. I try to spend some time on Quora.com each week to answer questions about whiskey, and this question popped up the other day. Is single malt whiskey blended? Well, that ties in perfectly with our conversation a few minutes ago with Davil Gandhi of the Lakes Distillery. 
who is a whiskey blender by training, even though his distillery focuses on single malts? Of course, the answer is yes. Single malt whiskeys are blended, with the exception of single barrel whiskeys, in which all of the whiskey comes from a single cask. Even then, unless it's bottled at cask strength, the blender is the one who decides how much water to add to that whiskey to reduce the strength to give it the most flavor. Blenders spend just as much time creating single malt whiskeys using a variety of different casks based on age, wood type, and what a cask has been used for previously. For instance, Davil Gandhi created his Whiskey Makers Reserve Batch Number 1 from a combination of Pedro Jimenez sherry and red wine casks made from three different types of oak, American, French, and Spanish oak. But batch number two, which I had my tasting notes for a few minutes ago, used some of those same PX and red wine casks. It also used some ex-bourbon casks, though, and it had some noticeable differences from batch number one. It is fair to say that the blending process might be even tougher for single malt whiskies than it is for creating blended whiskies. That's because when you're working with whiskies from different distilleries, it's easier to nose a batch and say, this could use some peated whiskey, or something like that. But when most of the casks that you're working with have a similar distillery character at their heart, it takes more work to tease out different aromas and flavors to not only create that unique blend, but one that can be repeated consistently from batch to batch over time. If you have something you'd like us to look at on a future episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links for our Whiskey Cast HD videos and the Whiskey Cast tasting panel, the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the whiskey photo of the week, our calendar of events, and of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes that goes back to 2005 just in case you need something to do over the holidays. We will have a fresh episode between Christmas and New Year's, including my take on the biggest whiskey stories of the year, and I hope you'll join us. No matter what holiday you're celebrating at this festive time of the year, we want to wish you the happiest of holidays, and may you have a wonderful holiday season and a great 2020. The search never ends. But it's nice when you can come in for a landing, pause and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey, matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast, then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2019, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.